Hello, everyone, and uh, I am thankful to be asked again to give a um, update on managing bone disease and multiple myeloma. My name is Dr. Mooney Cartley Brown, and I am one of the multiple myeloma physicians here at the Jerome Lipper Multiple Myeloma Center at Dana Farber Cancer Institute. Let's get started. So bone disease and multiple myeloma is um, a very big area of concern because as you know, uh, there is chronic pain and disability associated with uh, bone disease, as well as an increased mortality and morbidity. There is muscular dysfunction and decreased performance status, as well as most notably decreased quality of life for our patients. Approximately 80% of newly diagnosed multiple myeloma patients will have bone disease in multiple myeloma at the time of presentation. And uh, this can span anywhere from diffuse osteoporosis or osteopenia. It could be pathologic fractures, whether it's in the spine causing spinal cord compression or um, in the long bones causing bone pain or weight bearing fractures. Uh, the skeletal survey which is basically a series of x-rays. Uh, most patients will describe that as x-rays all over the body. That will pick up about 65% of vertebral fractures or 45% of rib um, disease. Uh, about 40% of patients will have some cranial bone lesion and 30% in the pelvis, 25% in the long bones. However, the, the the key note here is um, over time, whether you present with fractures or not, or whether you present with bone disease or not, um, over time, those lesions or development of skeletal related events will occur. And so um, the years following diagnosis is also important because the cumulative incidence of observed skeletal related events increases over time. So there are different ways to image uh, um, the bone. And conventionally, what we did was skeletal x-rays. Notice I said what we did, because this is a modality that is less expensive, very much accessible to um, you know, multiple uh, um, facilities. However, the concern now is it's less sensitive. So up to 50% of bone loss or um, bone lesions may be missed on x-rays. Whereas um, the um, soft tissue extramedullary plasmacytomas may also be missed um, because x-rays are more sensitive for um, evaluating the bone. PET-CT and MRI has been looked at um, for a few years now. Um, these modalities obviously are more expensive. However, the radiation exposure is um, less, especially with PET-CT. And when we talk about um, imaging, we're talking about the whole body. Um, there is increased sensitivity, however, with PET-CT and MRI of the whole body. Um, and the sensitivities range from the high 80s to high 90s, depending on the study that you're looking at. And I'm gonna touch on some of these uh, studies in, um, in the next few slides. And um, the key take home here is um, there are about 23% of bone lesions that can be detected on some of these um, images, especially PET compared to um, x-rays. And so, you know, that's really important. Um, and I'll talk more about that in the following slides. So the Casio PET study um, is a sub-study of the Cassiopeia study, which looked at daratumumab um, uh, of Velcade, um, thalidomide, and dexamethasone, so DARA VTD versus VTD. Um, and so they looked at a subset of patients who had received um, PET-CT imaging at baseline. And what was found was PET-CT imaging at baseline demonstrated some prognostic value for um, uh, uh, progression-free survival. So patients um, who had PET-negative disease um, versus PET positive disease did had longer PFS. Uh, and those patients who had uh, presence of extramedullary disease identified on PET uh, had a shorter progression-free survival. 
Uh, we also um, have some data from this, uh, and this was done by uh, Moreau and colleagues, uh, published in Ash Abstract in 2019, looking at um, measurable residual disease and how it correlates with PET-CT findings. And what was noticed is PET-CT and MRD negativity, both together um, shows that those patients had associated longer progression-free survivals. So PET-CT results were found to be complementary to MRD um, negativity. And so this is how the field is moving in terms of, you know, trying to uh, incorporate some of these more sensitive imaging um, and specific imaging modalities, uh, as well as kind of seeing how they correlate in terms of survival outcomes for our patients. Whole body dose, uh, low dose CT um, is also better than x-ray. And so this is a study by Hill and Grass that looked at over 200 patients. Now in the patient population, we had smoldering and um, patients who had active myeloma. And a little over half of, I mean, uh, sorry, a little over than uh, a quarter of the patients had lytic bone lesions that were seen on the uh, whole body CT scan that were not identified on the um, x-rays. And so again, here we have um, CT and x-rays being um, looked at directly in comparison for patients with active multiple myeloma or smoldering myeloma. And we're seeing that um, the CT is a better modality to um, identify any um, osteolytic lesions. Uh, I would also point out that this is a low dose CT. So we're not talking about um, increased radiation exposure. MRI uh, imaging, whole body MRI imaging versus uh, PET CT imaging has also been looked at. Now with whole, um, with whole body MRI, not every location is capable of uh, doing this type of imaging. Um, but again, if you compare the whole body MRI versus x-rays, we're seeing a little over 50% uh, of patients who had identified bone lesions on MRI that were not seen on x-rays. And then when you look at the PET-CT, extramedullary disease was identified, non-secretary disease was identified, solitary plasma cytomas were identified that were not seen on x-ray. And so this information has resulted in incorporation of these, you know, uh, uh, more sensitive uh, imaging modalities of PET, CT, CT, or MRI within the new criteria for um, diagnosis of multiple myeloma. And so if you are newly diagnosed with multiple myeloma, one of the things we are looking at is whether you have one or more osteolytic lesions on CT, PET CT, or whole body MRI. And then, um, you know, the, for the MRI lesion, the, the size of the lesion is five millimeters or greater. Um, and so um, that's going to be important in terms of your diagnostic workup because if you're on the cusp of high-risk smoldering versus active myeloma, and you had only a skeletal uh, survey, as opposed to a CT, PET-CT, or MRI, it might be warranted to get a better imaging modality at the outset to truly identify whether you have active disease or not. Now I'm going to throw this meta-analysis in there, because again, this is an update, and this is one of the um, one of the newer um, uh, analyses that were looked at is a meta-analysis of um, PET-CT versus MRI um, and uh, Rama and colleagues looked at this and published it in um, last year in 2022. So there were 12 studies that were kind of brought together in this meta-analysis. So about 373 myeloma patients with active disease Six of the studies uh, had uh, use of whole body MRI and PET-CT, four only looked at whole body MRI and two only used PET-CT. So when they pulled all the data and looked at the sensitivity for each imaging test, whole brain MRI um, 
came up as having a sensitivity of about 87% versus PET CT at 64%. Now, based on the parameters and um, the assessment, this was not statistically significant. However, um, it is suggestive um, uh, that um, you know the sensitivity of MRI might be a little bit better than PET CT. Uh, pool specificity of the MRI versus PET CT was flipped. So the PET CT had a better a specificity, sorry, uh, the PET CT had a better specific specificity than the MRI. Um, and so this data is, is, is still um, being looked at and being evaluated. And we, you know, meta-analysis just gives us some kind of signals um, but it means that we do need to kind of look into this further to evaluate whether there's a role for complementary use of whole body MRI and PET CT in assessing uh, myeloma response for our patients. So, what's the underlying pathophysiology of bone disease and multiple myeloma? There's a lot going on. Um, the myeloma cells are sending up signals to the uh, the bone building cells. Um, and so the osteoclast are the bone building cells of, um, of, the, uh, uh, of the body. And myeloma cells will secrete certain cytokines, which are proteins that um, are sent out in circulation. And once those proteins are um, uh, acknowledged by the osteoblasts like IL-3 or, I'm sorry, like IL-7 or uh, activin A, these proteins will suggest to slow down activity. So it inhibits the activity of the osteoblast. Think of blasts as builders. And then osteoclasts as they're resorbing bone, they're destroying bone. So the osteoclast activity is revved up, they're increased in their activity um, through cytokines like IL-3, through activating factors like MIP-1-alpha and uh, through rank ligand. And so you can see the myeloma cells, not only are they growing and doing their own thing within the bone marrow and um, elsewhere in the body, but they're also sending signals out to the bone to destroy bone more than you build bone. And that's part of the process that um, results in uh, bone destruction and bone disease and myeloma. Um, that is a simplified version. As you can see on the um, other imaging, there's a lot of signals between the myeloma plasma cell um, and the uh, bone marrow milieu, as well as the um, mesenchymal cells, bone marrow stromal cells, and osteoblasts and osteoclasts and osteophytes. Um, uh, so, um, you know, uh, this imbalance of bone destruction over bone building is something that um, we appreciate and we uh, target certain um, areas in order to um, somewhat uh, mitigate and alleviate those problems. And so, and so how do we uh, treat systemically bone disease and myeloma? Well, first and foremost, think about treating myeloma itself. Uh, and so if you have active myeloma, obviously you want to uh, have uh, the multiple myeloma directed therapies, which include proteasome inhibitors, immunomodulatory drugs, um, and other therapies, which we know um, are um, uh, constantly uh, increasing. We have um, uh, immunotherapies, we have um, cell therapies, and so we have things like cell mods that are um, in clinical trials, which are kind of a step up from the image. We have BCME targeted agents, um, whether they are bispecifics or um, CAR, -T -cell, uh, CAR T cell therapies um, that are uh, currently available within the past year. We've had um, three therapies under that umbrella available. Um, and then other clinical trial um, targets um, that are still in the works, but um, are showing quite good um, efficacy uh, for patients with myeloma. Bone directed therapies, um, the backbone of that are two types of agents, bisphosphonates, which we have a lot of information on, a lot of research has been done on 
on bisphosphonates, the poster child of bisphosphonates being Zomeda or Zolindronic acid, and then denosumab. Um, and these two agents we'll talk a little bit more about in the next few slides. Then there are surgical in interventions that may be necessary and radiation therapy that may be necessary. Um, and that's in the setting of just stabilizing things and palliating pain, um, especially with radiation therapy. Um, and we will talk about that as well. So switching gears, let's talk about denosumab. What is denosumab? It is a monoclonal antibody that binds to rank ligand. So remember when I showed you the earlier slide about um, osteoclast being um, uh, uh, activated and osteoblast being inhibited? Well, the rank ligand um, is important in that process. And so um, there is inhibition of formation and activation of osteoclast through the rank ligand, and denosumab um, uh, plays a role in that. So how do we know um, whether denosumab is the go-to for treating bone disease? Well, the first information we have has to do with bisphosphonates. And so we have a lot of data on bisphosphonates and I'll touch on that in a little while, but uh, zolindronic acid or zolandronate um, has been for some time identified as the ideal bisphosphonate for treating bone disease. However, in this particular study, denosumab was also looked at because denosumab does work through the rank ligand inhibition, and it was compared with zolandronate to see if there was a non-inferior um, outcome for patients in terms of skeletal-related events. And what was seen in this large study by Nupuraji and colleagues was in 2018, it's a phase three randomized study over 1,700 newly diagnosed multiple myeloma patients, um, pretty equally um, divided, 859 in each group. Um, and they received either denosumab with placebo or zolindronic acid with placebo, right? So you don't know which group is getting what because denosumab is given sub-Q and zolindronic acid is given IV. And so they had to be a placebo on either side to kind of mask which agent was being given. Um, and so the results actually panned out to show that denosumab was not inferior to zolindronic acid in terms of present, preventing skeletal rela related events. The um, osteonecrosis of the jaw, which is something that I will touch on uh, soon, uh, again, similar uh, rates were seen in both agents. Hypocalcemia, however, was slightly more um, in the denosumab group uh, at 17% versus 12% in the zolindronic acid group. And, um, you know, uh, there was some additional data that showed that there was um, some anti-myeloma effects of zolindronic acid that were not necessarily um, the same in the denosumab group. And so for those of you who like images and are more in tune with that, you can see from the... Um, from the graphs that literally um, they're both, the, the, the lines are both lying on top of each other, suggesting that um, there's not much of a difference. In terms of uh, the patients who had at least one event of um, skeletal um, related event, about 44% of the patients had that and 60% of those events occurred within the first three months. And so I mention this because, you know, it's really key to um, be aware that even in the patients who have um, identified um, skeletal related events early on, um, they, they will still potentially progress in terms of their bone disease. And even those who do not have bone disease at the offset or the diagnosis of newly diagnosed myeloma, they will also develop skeletal related events. So it's important um, to uh, note that whether you have identified bone lesions on PET, CT, or MRI at the start of your treatment, you should still be started on some form of uh, bone-directed therapy, whether it's zolindronic acid or denosumab. 
And so this again is just bringing home the, um, the differences that were noticed with denosumab in terms of hypocalcemia and in terms of renal toxicity, because zolindronic acid is renally cleared, we saw that um, there was increased renal toxicity with zolindronic acid versus with denosumab. And so the recommendations are you can use either zolindronic acid or denosumab for um, treatment of uh, bone disease in multiple myeloma patients. I do want to get into the bisphosphonate specifically. And so, you know, we have to take this back a ways. Um, when it comes to zolindronic acid, um, there was um, data that looked at zolindronic acid versus clodronate. We don't even use clodronate um, uh, for the, uh, the most part in America, but um, this was one of the bisphosphonates that was first um, utilized in this disease um, uh, internationally. And so it was compared to zolindronic acid. And you can see here clearly both, um, both curves separate right at the beginning. Um, within six months, you see a separation of the curves. Um, zolindronic acid showed improved overall survival, less skeletal related events and antimyeloma effects compared to um, clodronate. And if patients had bone lesions at baseline, um, you know, they would develop less bone lesions over time with use of zolindronate versus if they had no lesions at baseline, um, their, um, you know, if you looked over time, so if you looked at this graph goes up to 42 months, but, um, the, um, the development of bone disease in those patients was much less. It was 9% versus 17% for um, uh, clodronate. And so there's some other information and other studies that are not depicted here that looks at zolindronic acid versus permidronate. Permidronate is a well-known um, bisphosphonate that we use in the US. And um, there was non-inferior efficacy with these two agents. And so if your doctor has you on permidronate at 90 milligrams IV monthly, um, that's fine because there is no data to um, say that it is any less effective than zolindronic acid. The mechanism of action for bisphosphonates is um, to really inhibit osteoclast um, function. And so it's, it prevents um, apoptosis or um, cell death of the osteoblast and osteocytes because um, we need those osteoblasts to build the bone. Um, so that's one good thing. Um, it also has a high affinity for bone mineral. And so it binds to these um, hydroxyapatite crystals in the bone. Uh, so that's another way with, within which the bisphosphonates work that um, is separate from a way that the um, denosumab would work. And it prevents preferentially incorporates into sites of active bone remodeling. Um, and that is also separate from what the denosumab will do. Uh, again, I bring home the point here that it's cleared renally um, from circulation. And so renal function is gonna be important um, when it comes to deciding use of this agent versus denosumab. Um, it inhibits calcification and hydroxy appetite breakdown, which is another method uh, wherein it suppresses bone resorption. And so as of uh, 2021, there was an updated guideline by ASCO um, in terms of bisphosphonates and denosumab. And the recommendation is bisphosphonates and or denosumab is standard of care for multiple myeloma bone disease treatment. Uh, whether you use zolindronic acid or permidronate, uh, they're not inferior, so you can use either for all newly diagnosed um, patients with multiple myeloma, whether or not they have evidence of bone disease. There's a lot of information on zolindronic acid. So when you think of the bisphosphonates, zolindronic acid seems to be preferred over other agents. Um, if patients have responded to myeloma therapy and have um, a very good partial response or better, that means more than 90% of their measurable myeloma protein has been reduced to more than 90%. 
um, then the idea is for this patient within that first 12 months, they can continue on zoledronic acid monthly. And then after that 12 month period, there is the potential to consider reducing the frequency to every three months. Okay, and I'll show some data on that. Denosumab is preferred for patients with renal impairment. We talked about that a little bit earlier uh, because zoledronic acid is renally cleared. And so um, denosumab is um, preferred in the setting of patients with renal uh, impairment with myeloma. There is a caveat that denosumab discontinuation has a rebound effect. And so when you discontinue the denosumab, you can get a rebound uh, increase in bone resorption. And so if patients are discontinued on the agent, then there is a suggested recommendation of use of a, at least a single dose of zoledronic acid to prevent uh, rebound effects um, within the six months after the last do dose of denosumab. So just to um, talk a little bit about the side effects of bisphosphonates and um, denosumab, we talked about osteonecrosis of the draw. And in this particular MRC9 trial subgroup analysis, um, you know, uh, when it comes to once monthly use of zoledronic acid versus every three monthly use of zoledronic acid, what we see is there is similar efficacy uh, in the um, Q3 month interval as we see in the Q monthly interval. And as you can see from the graph, um, they're essentially lying on top of each other. So the outcomes are pretty similar. Um, and the benefit of that is re reduced osteonecrosis of the jaw, which, um, which, which is highly appreciated. And so that uh, leans into one of the reasons why, I'll go back to this previous slide, why the updated guidelines of ASCO suggest that if a patient has um, a well-controlled disease um, within that first year of therapy, then you may consider um, reduced frequency of the zoledronic acid um, to mitigate potential ONJ occurring as a toxicity. And what does ONJ look like and what are the other um, most um, notable adverse effects of bisphosphonates? Um, and denosumab, well, ONJ occurs about three to 4%, as we had mentioned earlier. They can, um, you know, you can risk stratify patients. So if you have um, significant um, periodontal or cavitary or other oral um, lesions or oral disease, um, that would put you at higher risk. Um, in the event that you do develop osteonecrosis of the jaw, discontinuation of the bisphosphonate or denosumab is recommended. Um, and, um, and so um, it doesn't have to be forever. A lot of patients do not want to go back on it, but uh, you know, there is a little bit of controversy between the, the um, dental community and, and or maxillofacial in regards to how we manage patients who have had ONG and the timeline of when to it's, it's clear to put them back on therapy if, if necessary. Um, so that is still, um, you know, something to evaluate and look into. Now, the other thing that is less talked about is atypical stress factors, which usually occur more in the femoral um, area, a femoral trochanter, which is that upper thigh area you can see um, on the x-ray uh, where the um, hip bone is kind of, um, uh, you know, the pelvis and the um, femur uh, kind of attach and right at the neck of the femur is where the fracture tends to occur. And it's because, you know, that is a weight bearing bone, a significant weight bearing bone of the body. And with use of these agents, you get brittle bone. I mean, the lack of bone resorption and the osteoclast in inhibition causes less remodeling of bone. And so the bone tends to be a little bit more brittle. And, um, and so these fractures are um, uh, uh, increased uh, risk of occurring. 
Uh, I'm going to spend one slide on vertebroplasty um, and say that this is really just a modality to stabilize the spine. So if there's a patient who's having a significant uh, compression fracture in the area, which we're concerned about impending cord compression or other um, um, uh, areas of, of neurological compromise, then um, one can do a minimally invasive procedure, which is called vertebroplasty or kyphoplasty. So under fluoroscopic guidance, there is a balloon um, uh, that is percutaneously inserted. It's inflated once it's in, as you can see, according to the pictures, and then it's deflated. So the inflation just kind of allows for room so that um, you can have a space within the compressed bone to inject the polymethyl methacrylate, which is essentially biological cement, so to speak. Um, and that will stabilize that particular vertebrae that was um, uh, treated. Now, I just want to mention that there are lots of potential targets for um, uh, bone, uh, bone disease in multiple myeloma. A lot of these targets have been looked at in the past. Some of them are still being looked at. Some of them are not as um, efficacious thus far. Um, but as you can see here, there is um, inhibition of a lot of these um, uh, cytokines and interactions between the multiple myeloma plasma cell and the um, osteoclast. Um, to try to inhibit the bone disease or at least reduce the occurrence of bone disease in multiple myeloma. So um, inhibition of MIP1-alpha is something that's being looked at. Targeting IL-6 um, is also something that's, look, that's being um, evaluated. Um, targeting the MAP kinase pathway um, and integrins um, are also being evaluated um, as well as um, how to um, uh, target DKK1 and other um, WNT antagonists is also being looked at. So there is a lot of um, early work that's being done on this. Um, there's not a lot that is currently in the, I guess, phase two or phase three setting right now, but uh, we'll keep you all posted on that information as they roll out. Overall, in summary, um, when you think about bone disease and multiple myeloma, you think about increased mortality and morbidity for our patients. Again, most of our patients are diagnosed with multiple myeloma in their mid 60s and older. And so these are patients who, um, you know, functional, morta uh, functional um, activity is, is extremely important and can uh, really do affect their mortality significantly. Chronic pain, disability can be an issue, decreased uh, performance status and quality of life. And so we really need to identify the fact that um, this is a part of multiple myeloma disease and um, it needs to be properly um, addressed and treated at the, at the time of diagnosis of active myeloma. Uh, MRI, CT scans, PET CT um, are all imaging modalities that have shown over and over again that they have a better sensitivity and specificity um, over whole brain x rays for bone lesions. And so, in this country, at the time of diagnosis, you should be having either one of these imaging modalities. They do not increase your radiation exposure, they're low dose radiation, so MRI, CT scans, or PET-CT at the start of your diagnostic workup for myeloma is going to be key. Skeletal surveys are great, but not as sensitive, and you can miss lesions um, anywhere from 25 to 50% uh, of lesions can be missed, and we're talking about a uh, lump sum of extra medullary disease lesions as well as um, bone lesions. And so for this reason, it's been included, MRI, CT, PET-CT have been included in the International Myeloma Working Group Diagnostic Criteria for Newly Diagnosed Myeloma. So that shows you the gravity and the importance of that. It's also been included in the ASCO guidelines as well. Um, and so more and more studies are being looked at to see 
how best should we image our patients, not just in the diagnostic setting, but also as patients are being managed for their multiple myeloma. Um, when do we repeat PET CT? When do we repeat MRI? And should we be using a, um, you know, um, uh, a mix of these imaging modalities uh, given that MRI and PET-CT, as I showed you in this um, meta-analysis, there's a possibility that they may be complementary to each other. And so bisphosphonates, um, the data on that shows that zolindronic acid is the poster child and um, has uh, overall survival benefit with use compared to quadronate, which we don't use in this country, but it's not inferior to pomidronate. Denosumab, and pomidronate have shown non-inferiority to zolindronic acid. And so either of those are good to be used in terms of bone disease. If the patient has renal insufficiency or renal disease, then the preferred agent would be denosumab, which is a subcutaneous injection. Um, pomidronate and zolindronic acid are intravenous. Um, and either one of those can be used in patients with um, no renal issues. And new targets are on the horizon for um, addressing bone disease in multiple myeloma. And with that, I want to say thank you. Thank you for listening. Um, you know, you are the patients and families that are going through this and having to deal with the adverse outcomes from this particular disease. And so I really want to say thank you. And um, I hope I can do more for you in the future. Uh, thank you to my wonderful colleagues at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, um, Department of Medical Oncology and the Jerome Lipper Myeloma Center. Um, and to all my colleagues in general in hematologic malignancy and medical oncology who support clinical research and development with advanced treatment outcomes for all our patients, um, despite where they come from, despite backgrounds, despite who they are. Um, your health is of most important and our patients with multiple myeloma, again, that multiple means a lot of things. So, um, you know, multiple, uh, multiple bone lesions, uh, multiple problems um, that come along with this particular malignancy. So thank you. <laughs>